Father, as we just sang there, show me your way. God, I pray that we could see your way through your truth today. God, that we would know them and be able to walk in truth and obedience before you. God, that we would walk in faith, surrendered and submitted to your way. Father, that we would be hearers of your word, but more importantly, doers of your word. Father, I pray that by the power of your spirit, you would lead us into all truth now. God, as we open up your word and as we seek to discover what it is you have for us today, God, that the spirit of the living God would pour into our hearts and our minds an understanding of what you have for us today. And God, that it would impact us in a mighty and powerful way. That your word would not return void, but it would accomplish what you send it out to do. Father, speak through me now. It's in the beautiful name of Christ that I pray. Amen. I invite you to turn to the book of John, chapter 3. As we continue our journey through the gospel of John. Uh, We're going to be looking at verses 22 through 36 today. We're going to read it in its entirety uh, so that we can see the scope of this text, and then we'll begin to unpack it and see what it is that we can discover uh, about Christ and about his mission and really what it is that we can discover from the truth of God's word. So I want to begin this morning just by reading this section of scripture to us in its entirety, beginning in verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon, near Salem, because water was plentiful there, and the people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put into prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, He who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness about me that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way, and he who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and is giving all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, and whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. There are a lot of things that we will unpack as we journey through this text together, and I don't know how far we'll get today, but I I want us to understand the context of what's going on here. In verse 22, it says, after this, and so what that's referring to is is Jesus doing miraculous signs and wonders and being there at Jerusalem at Passover and talking to Nicodemus and sharing with him the reality that he has come bringing the good news, bringing the gospel to fulfill that in his death on the cross, but we must be born again to receive him and to receive his kingdom. And so it says after that moment, after that time, he and his disciples are then traveling. They're going throughout the Judean countryside, and as they're traveling and as they're going, there are people who are coming to Christ in faith, surrendering to him, wishing and desiring to be baptized. And so it says here that he remained there and he was baptizing them. But when John, the apostle, opens his gospel, he refers to one who has been sent before Christ, who is to prepare the way for him, and that is John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist comes bringing a message of repentance, a message that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and that we therefore must repent and be baptized. 
And so John has this ministry. It's the ministry that, to which God has called him to. Sovereignly, God has chosen John the Baptist for this role. It was foretold to his father. It was prophesied about him that he would be this person. And he confesses this uh, of himself. And we'll look at that in just a moment. But it says here that Jesus is baptizing. And John, because he has not been yet put in prison, is also baptizing. And in verse 25, this is where I want us to begin to dig and to discuss. It says, now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. So within the, the old covenant system, within the law that was passed down to the followers of God, to his chosen people, there was this purification rite or thing that they did whereby they were cleansed. And baptism at that time was sort of one of those methods that they do that. And there's this discussion, really it's a debate or an argument that arises between John's disciples, those who are following John, and a certain Jew. It's never mentioned who this Jew is, but they're sort of arguing over baptism. And look at John's disciples. Look at what they say to him. And they came to John and said, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you have borne witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. So here we see that John's disciples view Jesus as competition. They view Christ as the one who is competing with the role or the ministry that their person they're following after is all about. And so this picture that I want us to see here today is that we should never be following a person outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want people to be disciples of me as their pastor. I want to point you to the one I want you to be a disciple of. Amen? I want you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, not of me, because if you put it on me, then these kind of things come about. They're following John. They're concerned about John and his ministry. They want John to be successful because it bears good on them as his followers, and he sees Jesus. They look upon Jesus, who is baptizing, and they see him as competition. And as this argument, as this debate wages on between these disciples who are following John and this certain Jew, they are debating and arguing over the Old Covenant, over the law. Within the Old Covenant, and if you've been with us on Wednesday night, we've been dealing with the Old Covenant in its entirety. The Old Covenant was set up and the law was given by God to the people to show his holy righteous standard, that this is what I deem as right or holy before me. These are the requirements of mine. That's what God said. So the law was put in place so that we could see his righteousness and his holiness and his standard. It was also there to reveal to us that because of our fallen nature, because of our depravity, that we could not keep it. It was there to reveal sin and our failure of obedience. The fact that we could not adhere to the law, and, and Paul talks about this in Romans. If you're in A.J. Sunday School class, he talked about this a little bit this morning. Romans chapter 7, in Romans 7, 7, Paul says, I would not even have known what sin was or what it was about or how it affected me apart from the law. Without the law, I wouldn't have known this. So the law was there to reveal our sin and our failure. He goes on to say in chapter Seven, that the law was insufficient. It could not bring redemption or salvation because it had been weakened by the flesh. We could not adhere to God's standards in order to be right before him. Galatians 3.24, it talks about how the law then was a, a schoolmaster, a guardian, someone who was put over us to keep us where we needed to be, that we would know right from wrong and try to live that out until Jesus would come whereby we would surrender in faith and be born again, no longer slave to sin, no longer slave to the body of flesh, but set free from it. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, and we no longer have to give in to the desires of our flesh. Paul goes on to expound upon this in Galatians in chapter 5 when he says, if we walk by this spirit that has been given to us by faith in Jesus Christ, that we no longer gratify the desires of of our flesh. So this law that's given, this, this thing that they're arguing over within the law about purification, it was meant to reveal sin and failure of obedience and thereby lead us to humble submission unto God, which would be later ultimately fulfilled through Jesus Christ. 
They were to submit to God and follow his way to obey his commandments in all things. And that's when you see the covenant issue. If you follow me, if you obey me, if you are faithful to me, I'm going to bless you, God says. But if you disobey and if you are unfaithful, then there are going to be these curses upon you. It was meant to have us be submitted unto him and it would be finalized through Jesus Christ. But that's not what occurs. The reality that it was meant to give life or the reality that was then therefore to reveal sin and our failure so that we would humbly submit to Christ when he came, it didn't cause that. Instead, what it did was it became an external source for people's pride and arrogance whereby they would say, look at all this good that I'm doing and that they would then build up a false hope of salvation, that they could somehow be good enough under the law to be saved and to be right before God. The problem with that is, is that the Bible is clear that says we have all done what, church? Sin, right? And we, Bobby was saying it here, fallen short of God's glory. We have all sinned. We are all guilty already. And so we have no hope under the law. We have no means under the law for salvation. It was never intended to bring salvation. It was weak because of the flesh. And so these people have taken it on as a thing of legalism as a ritualism as tradition for themselves and they've built themselves up in pride and arrogance and we call that and the bible calls this self-righteousness now what is self-righteousness what does that look like in the eyes of god all the righteousness that we can produce and bring the bible says what about that filthy rags disgusting it is Instead of this thing that meant to reveal sin so that we can then submit to Christ, they had puffed themselves up in pride and arrogance. They had formed a superficial morality because of the law. They had gone into this legalistic ritualism and followed all these traditions. And we see an example of this in Matthew chapter 15. Turn there. You might say, well, preacher, why are we spending so much time dealing with the old covenant, dealing with the law? Because the argument that they're having is based upon this reality, based upon this, this truth to them that they were going to be right before God because of their adherence to these customs and to these ordinances and to these rituals that they were following. Not knowing that each one of those was intended to paint a picture of Christ. Jesus said it himself. You search the scriptures looking for salvation. You're searching through the old covenant. You're searching through the book of the law, the Torah, to find salvation in it. And you don't know that it all testifies about me. That's what Jesus said. So they're arguing for something that doesn't even matter. Look at Matthew 15, beginning in verse 1. Jesus confronts this ideology. He confronts this heart. He confronts this method through which people are living, and this would be talking to the Pharisees. Verse 1 says, Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. So they're concerned with their tradition or their ritualism or their legalistic nature in accordance with the law and not understanding that Jesus is the one who is there to bring redemption, to bring atonement, to bring forgiveness of sin. And so they want to confront him on the fact that these people are not keeping their tradition. Listen to Christ's answer to this, verse 3. He answered them, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? They're concerned about their tradition and the things that they're used to and what they like and how they want to see be seen as pious and holy before the other people. And God, uh, Jesus says, you're breaking God's commandment. You're breaking the law in holding to your tradition. For God commanded, your, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. For the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. They were clinging to this tradition that they had built up for themselves based on their interpretation of God's 
law, and they were forsaking the commandment of God. They were saying, I'm going to, the honor that I meant to bestow on you, it's really going to be given to God. And really, it wasn't for God's glory. It was for their own glory. And Jesus says, for the sake of your tradition, for the sake of your self-righteousness and your glory, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you when he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You see, these people were caught up in these ritualistic purification rites. They weren't looking at the bigger picture. They weren't seeing the reality of Christ coming and baptizing. And really, they weren't even understanding John's role within this framework. They were having this discussion, and they go, and you know their hearts are not right, because when they go to John, they say, look, he's over there competing against you, and not only is he competing against you, everybody is going to him rather than coming to you. Do you see where they're standing, where their hearts lie here? Looking at him, he is baptizing. All of them are going to him. He is your competition, John. What are you going to do about it? But I love the heart of John the Baptist. I love his response and really his understanding of God's sovereignty and his life and his plan for his life. And he even makes profession of this about himself. Look at how he answers. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. Unless God ordains it, unless God purposes it, unless it's God's will, there's not going to be anything that I'm going to do to gain these followers back, and nor does he want to, but he's saying unless God has purposed it and planned it, it's not going to succeed. Right, church? If God is not the builder, what do the laborers do? What do you say, Bobby? Nothing. The, the scriptures, well, that's, that's our nomenclature, the scriptures say they labor in vain. They work in vain. If God's not the one that's a part of it and building it, it's for nothing. John recognizes and understands this. Unless God gives it, I cannot take it. Verse 28, he says, you yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Flip back to chapter 1 real quick. I want us to read the words of John the Baptist as testified about by the Apostle John in writing his gospel. What John the Baptist is saying of himself, he says there that, You even bear witness that I've already said I am not the Christ. So if I'm not the Christ, why should I care that I lose people or don't have the glory or the prestige? Chapter 1, verse 19. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you a prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah has said. That's found in Isaiah chapter 40, as it's been prophesied about John the Baptist, this one who is going to prepare the way, and he's going to confess this in just a moment in a different way. I am the one in the wilderness crying out, making straight the paths, making the area and the the preparations ready for the way of the Lord, as it's been prophesied about me. Now they had sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither Christ nor Elijah nor a prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. His confession, his point of view about who he is in light of who Christ is, is that he has simply been sent to prepare the way for the coming Messiah, the coming chosen one, the anointed one. And that when he views him and when he sees him, he says, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal. And we've dealt with that in the past, right, church? You know of my dislike for feet. Amen? Y- y'all remember this about me, right? That I can't stand feet. 
And yet for the servant, it was the lowliest of servants who had to take the sandals off before the supper to wash the guest's feet so that they could come into the home. It was the worst of the worst things. And John says, I'm not even worthy to do that lowly of a thing unto the one who's coming after me. I am not the Christ. The one who comes, I baptize with water, but the one who comes is going to baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. This is whom John confesses about. He tells his followers, why do you think that I should care about this? I am not the Christ. And he gives us an example in verse 29. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly when he hears the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. So I want to explain this culturally for us today. Whenever a wedding was thrown and whenever the bridegroom was about to take his bride as his wife, the friend of the bridegroom, that's what we in this day and age would call the best man, was to make all the preparations necessary for that to occur. So he was the one that would go before the bridegroom to make everything ready, to make sure everything was set so that when the bridegroom came, he could receive his bride to himself and there would be no hiccups, there would be no problems going on. This is how a Jewish wedding would have occurred. The friend of the bridegroom was responsible for all the preparations, making sure that things were ready. Doesn't that sound like what John the Baptist is all about? I've come to make straight the path, to make ready, to cry out in the wilderness, Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for he is coming. He was the best man. He was the friend of the bridegroom. And he goes on to say that when this person hears the voice of the bridegroom, in, in a wedding, when they would hear that the bridegroom had come in, there would be great rejoicing and celebration because they knew the marriage was going to take place. And John says, I've heard the voice of the one who's coming, the bridegroom, the one who's going to come and redeem and take his bride to himself. And therefore, my joy is now complete. What John is saying here is that my work is done. My ministry is coming to an end. And my joy has been made complete by doing this. And he confesses this in verse 30. He must increase and I must decrease. You see, John's followers, they wanted John to continue having an extraordinary ministry. They wanted John to continue having acclaim throughout the region because everybody was going to John the Baptist to be baptized. But now they're all going to Christ. And John says, my ministry has been fulfilled. It's complete. The bridegroom has come. The friend of the bridegroom must step out of the way. I must decrease or diminish because Christ must be exalted. Church, that should be the hearts of every one of us in this room today. That we should be made low, that we should be nothing, that we and of ourselves should decrease so that Christ may be exalted. And why would that be so? So that he is glorified. I don't want anyone following me because I don't want the glory. I want to point all of you to Jesus. Be a disciple of Christ so that he might be glorified. John says, I must decrease because he must increase. He is the chosen one. He is the anointed one. He is the savior of the world. He is the Messiah, and he has come. My work is finished. I've accomplished what I must do. I don't know if John knew that he would then be later arrested and beheaded or not. I just simply know that in his heart he trusted God, and he knew God's plan was good, and he knew God was sovereign. And he said, God, whatever it is that you have for me, as I decrease, whatever that means, I pray that you are exalted and glorified. Later, John the Baptist would be arrested on trumped up charges, yet he would not stand against them. He would not deny that he had done this thing where he would reject this woman because she was making false, um, what do you call that? Just went blank. Uh, not accusations, that was part of it, but advances toward him, that he, she wanted to have a, a wrong relationship with John the Baptist, and he rejected that because he was going to stand for what God had designed and God had planned, and ultimately, he was beheaded and killed and martyred for his faith and his ministry. I must decrease. Christ must 
increase for his glory. Verse 31, he says, he who comes from above is above all. He is the one who is sovereign. He is the one who is above all. In him, all things were made. Through him, all things were made. And for him, all things were made. He is above all. He is preeminent and sovereign. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in a nursery way. But he who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard. The message that Christ brought was from the throne room of the Father. The good news, the gospel that was bringing here, he had bore witness about what he had seen and heard. And listen to what it says. No one received his testimony. As Jesus came to preach the gospel, to preach the kingdom, to preach repentance, and to provide the way and the means for those things, people rejected him, and they would not receive his testimony. Church, I pray today in this place that we do not reject Christ and his word, that we do not reject his way, the means through which he has given us unto salvation through the gospel, that we do not reject the testimony of John the Baptist, of John the Apostle, and their witness about Jesus Christ and who he was. John ultimately, as you remember, wrote this gospel to bear witness to these things about the gospel, about Jesus and why he came and what he accomplished on the cross. My prayer for us today is that we do not reject his testimony, that we do not reject that which he is showing us, but that we see that Christ is above all and in all and through all, and that we must submit to him. The word of God is not given to us so that we can simply know right from wrong and choose, but it's given to us to show us that we are already sinners and that we fall short and that our only hope is in Jesus Christ. But then upon submission and surrender to him, he then empowers us to live for him, to be obedient to him, and he also sets us free from this body of flesh that the law could not bring salvation because it was weakened by. But now he has freed us from that, empowered us to live holy and righteous lives. Let us not deny his testimony today. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word of truth. I thank you for the testimony that we have about Christ and the gospel and his way. I thank you for the heart of John the Baptist and his desire to give you glory no matter the cost. Even to his own pride or to his own ministry, he said, I must decrease because Christ must be exalted above me. He is above me. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Lord, that we could have hearts like that, that in humility are so surrendered, so submissive to Christ. Lord, that we would not, by hardness of heart or being stiff-necked and stubborn or rebellious, reject the testimony that we have heard about Jesus and about his gospel. That we would not reject the testimony that John the Baptist and John the Apostle have spoken to us. But in all humility, as we've been revealed to be sinners by your word, that your law has shown us that we have fallen short, and that Christ is our only hope, our only means, our only way, and that we must fully and completely die to self and submit to him as Lord and Savior, thus being born again. Jesus said, unless we are born again, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. Thank you for your word of truth, God. I thank you so much that you've given us these words so that we could know the truth and the truth could set us free. It's in Jesus' name. All the people said, amen. amen.